ready for this lesson because this is a lesson that we all need to hear. Pastors, teachers, ministers, Christians, churches, this is a lesson that we need to hear. Because when we look at the land of Kadesh Barnea, we're talking about the children of Israel who are about to receive the promised land. That promise that God had said, I will give you a land flowing with milk and honey. They are on the brink of receiving that value. You look at Numbers chapter 13, Numbers 14, it has this story. And in Numbers 13 and 14, we learn how the children of Israel come to the brink. They can see the land of milk and honey. But there was something standing in the way. It was called faith. It was something standing in the way. The lack of faith. They did not have enough faith to step up and receive the promise of God. Rather, they stepped back. They regressed. And that became a problem. Because it made God angry. So the title of this lesson is simply... Just do what God says. Why can't we just do what God says? God promised to rescue them from Egypt. Did he not rescue them? They came up out of Egypt and God promised them a land filled with milk and honey. And they were on the brink of receiving it. But there was something they forgot. They forgot to have faith. They forgot to have faith. The, the spies went down in the land. They saw the giants in the land. And they said, there's no way we can beat them. We can't defeat them. They are tougher. They are taller. They are larger. Their cities are walled. We just can't do it. Joshua and Caleb said, yes, we can. Joshua and Caleb said, yes, we can. My friends, when it comes down to the, God's promises, when it comes down to fulfilling what God has in store for all of us, we have got to say, yes, we can. We've got to be Joshua and Caleb. We can't turn our backs and walk away. We can't be all caught up with fear and faithlessness. We have got to say, yes, we can. In Numbers 14, God expressed some giant displeasure and anger for the people. He says, you see the land. It is there for the taking. I will fulfill my promise to you. But you stand here and you make me angry with your complaining. Amen. What kind of complaining were they doing? Well, when you look at the first part of Numbers, uh, verses 1 through 3, or 14, 1 through 3, the Bible clearly talks about how they were saying it was better in Egypt than it is for us right now. We need to turn around and go back. I mean, they actually charged Moses and wanted to go back to Egypt after over 300 years of slavery. They had forgotten a lot. And I'm going to share this sheet with you, but let me share with you some of the things they forgot. God brought them to the brink of the land of milk and honey. They're murmuring, they're complaining, but here's what they forgot. Number one, they rebelled against God right at the promised land, forgetting that they had seen 10 supernatural plagues that God sent upon Egypt. Amen? Y'all remember that? Yeah. 10 plagues on the land of Egypt. They forgot. They witnessed the first Passover where God spared the Israelites. Remember, they painted the lamb's blood over the doorway and the death angel came and the death angel did what? Passed over them. They Forgot about that. They saw God open the hearts of the Egyptians when it was time for them to go and share possessions. The Egyptians had suffered, but when they left the land of Egypt, they left with some of the possessions of the Egyptians because the Egyptians gave it to them. That was God. They forgot. What else did they forget? They forgot all about the many great things that God had done while they were out there. Think with me for a moment. When they were out in the desert 
wandering. And you see this picture of the desert here. They were out there wandering in this hot desert, which you and I can definitely identify with. What did God do for them in the desert? They got supernatural help. What happened in the desert? The eagle's wings helped them reach the finger of the Red Sea. They had a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to guide them and protect them. They experienced a miracle crossing at the Red Sea, whereby you saw that the Egyptian army perished. Amen? They perished. But Israel walked across 2,500 feet across the ocean. Listen, that was deep. 2,500 feet water towering over them but they walked across on dry land they saw God supernaturally provide what? water out of a rock in Raphidium these are the people that are complaining right there in the land, near the land of milk and honey how soon they forget that it was God who helped them defeat the Amalekites as Aaron and her held up their arms. Y'all remember that? The arms go up, win. Arms go down, lose. They got around him, held his arms up, and they got the victory. My friends, listen. We just need to do what God says. Because it is obvious that the children of Israel who received manna and quail in the desert. There's no food in the desert. How were they fed walking through this wasteland, how were they fed? Supernatural by God. Listen, how could they forget that? How could they walk out on that? God was so good to them, yet when they got to the brink of the land of promise, they grumbled, they murmured, they screamed, they yelled, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sounds like the church today, my friends. Sounds like this place today. They had seen enough miracles to be able to trust God. Am I right about it? Yes. Listen, I only need to see one miracle. One miracle. One miracle. Yes. But these uh, Israelites were exposed to over a dozen miracles in the desert, and they survived. Four, three, one. Yet they complained when God was about to fulfill that great promise. Yes. God proved to them he was a miracle worker. God proved to them that he was a way maker. God proved to him, to all of them, who he was and is. Yet they complain. And yet they turn their backs. So as a result of it, Numbers 13 and 14, God said, I've had enough. God said, I've had enough. Your spies have come back with a lie. They've been faithless. And you guys have followed them except Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, the only two who see this land. Everybody over the age of 20, you're going to perish in the desert because of your lack of faith, because of your murmuring, because of your complaining. You are out of here. You know, it's a terrible thing to have God pronounce a curse on us. Amen? Amen. We do not want God to be angry with us. You never want God to pronounce a curse upon you. Yet they were forced to walk into the wilderness for 40 years until all of those over the age of 20 died. Why did that happen? Right there. Right there, rebellion. Right there, complaining. Right there, murmuring. God showed his love. God gave them everything that he could give. Why are we so hard-headed when all we have to do is do what God says? Just do what God says. You know, I think about the value. What is the value of obedience? When you obey God, God will prosper you. God will care for you. God will protect you. It's when we walk outside of that protection in disobedience that we run the risk of being lost. Amen? Amen? And we see there's a high price to pay. They never entered the promised land 
because of their disobedience. They never entered the promised land because they murmured and complained against this God who had done so much for them. Over 12 miraculous events that they witnessed, including the obliteration of the Egyptian army. And they had all of the gold. They had everything they needed to restart that nation. Restart. They had everything they need. God said, I have given you all that you need. I've given you God. I've given you food from heaven. Yeah. Yet you complain and murmur. Listen, when I read that passage, I'm humble because I'm thinking, as much as God takes care of us, why do we walk away? Why do we complain? Why do we murmur? That's what I'm saying wrong. And I know sometimes the devil is in the mix where he causes us to think about the bad things or think about the things we don't have or think about how tough it is for us right now. And sometimes we get sucked into that vacuum of complaint, that vacuum of murmuring, that vacuum of cursing. But my friends, when you feel the suck and the draw of that vacuum, you need to go to God. Go to your knees and go to God. Amen. Amen. Go to your knees and go to God and say, God, I am thankful to you. God, I give praise to you. God, I honor you. I will not display disappointment in you. I will not display unthankfulness or unholiness before you. Lord, you are God, and I give thanks for all that you do. I may not be where I want to be, but I give thanks for what you're doing. I may not have the money that I want to have, but I give thanks for what you're doing. I may not be able to eat at the downtown restaurants in Scottsdale or, or Phoenix, but you know what? I'm thankful, Lord, for what you do. I'm thankful. I don't complain and I don't murmur because when I look at Kadesh Barnea and I look at what happened there, I look at how soon we forget the goodness of God, how soon we forget the mercy of God, how soon we forget the care of God, how soon and how quick we are to complain. My friends, the devil wants you to complain. The devil wants you to murmur. The devil wants you to lose your faith. But my friends, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For one that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of all of us who diligently seek him. That's Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. We must have faith and we must not lose it. We must protect it. You know what has value? Our faith has value. Our faith has value. I'm going to tell you a little story. Yesterday I was up in Scottsdale at a meeting uh, and, and I was amongst people who were talking about what can we do about homelessness? What can we do about homelessness? How can we be involved and all this kind of stuff? And I'm sitting there going, guys, get involved. Don't just sit around the table talking about it. Get involved. Do something. You've got money. You've got value. You've got all of this. And all you guys want to do is sit around and a table and talk about it. Stop talking about it and do something. Do something. Right. And, and, and that's that. I was sitting there at that table just dumbfounded at what I'm seeing. People with money who are doing nothing. People with money. Listen, I walked out of that building and uh, there was a DeLorean parked out there. There were Alfa Romero's parked out there all fr up front. And they were just displaying all of their prosperity. And I'm sitting there going, listen, you can sell that car and help someone that's homeless. Exactly. There's a lot that they can do to help us. But my friends, you see, because of the disobedience and because of the selfishness, they think, well, you know, uh, we, what are we going to do? Listen, there's plenty you can do. You, you got to. That's right. That's right. So my thing is this. We don't need to be like the children of Israel. There are so many people today living like the children of Israel. They've been blessed. Life is good. But they refuse to stop long enough to see how they can help somebody. You see, helping somebody is not always done by just writing a check to an organization. Helping somebody is when you roll up your sleeves 
and you come out into the streets and you walk along in someone's moccasins and you walk that mile with them and you take off your garment and you give them your coat and you give them your cloak also. That's how you help somebody. That's how you show the love of God. My friends, it's time for us to be obedient and do what God says. God has delivered a message through his son, Jesus Christ. And that message is that we love one another. Amen. That message is that we serve one another. That message is that we help one another. That message is that we are faithful in carrying out the words of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Over 2,000 years ago, he left us words in red. Amen? Amen. And those words in red that are coming from his mouth and they're sealed by his blood. Those words in red should mean something to every child of God. We shouldn't stand on the brink of the promised land like the children of Israel and complain. We shouldn't stand there with our idle hands in our pockets. We need to get up and do something. Amen. We need to get up and be faithful. We need to get up and get involved. We need to stop talking about it and do something. That's right. Exactly. We need to look around and say, do I need two DeLoreans? I don't. Do I need five homes? I don't. Do I need a nine car garage? I don't. My friends, what God has been blessing me with, I need to flip and turn to help my fellow man. Get up on his feet. Get up on her feet. That's what I need to do. Uh huh. Pray for us that we sell our house in, in California. Oh yeah, you what know. Are you doing with this place? Right, exactly. We need to have a compassionate approach because that compassionate approach is what Jesus showed. Yeah. And when we show that compassionate approach, we can make a difference. Amen. We have been a society that has forgotten compassion. That has forgotten the definition of love. We are a society that has become so selfish that we don't want to serve anybody except ourselves. It is time that changed. You see, the problem in Israel was just that. So much thinking of one's own self that they complained against God so bad that they could not see. Their eyes were blinded. They could not see the miracles. They could not see the rescue from Egypt. They could not see being spared from the angel of death. They could not see the manna falling from heaven. This is what happens when we become very, very selfish. And today, the United States of America is a mirror of the children of Israel. We cannot see the blessings of God because of our own selfishness and our own sin. Our own desire to serve ourselves and to enjoy our own goodness and our own labors. We cannot see the value of reaching out and making a difference. My friends, the children of Israel, they lost the land of promise because of disobedience. They lost the land of promise because of lack of faith. They lost the land of promise because they were disobedient to God. The spies report was disobedient. The murmuring against God was disobedient. They lost their faith and it cost them 40 years in the desert. I don't know about you, but I do not want to wander 40 years in the desert, amen? 40 years, it was right there. They went around circle and circle and circle and circle. And the land was right there, green, prosperous, growing. But they were going around in circle and circle after circle until all of those over the age of 20 were gone. My friends, that is a high price to pay for disobedience. When you know prosperity is right there. When you know the promised land is right there. When you know everything that God promises is right there. How many people, even today, are doing the same thing? Eternity is right there. Jesus has already died on the cross. Amen? 
Jesus has already paved the way. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. He's already done the heavy lifted. Amen. He's already done the hard work. But many of us are just walking and wandering like the Israelites in the, in the desert. Forty years we wander, going round in a circle, round and round, living our life, doing our thing. And the promised land is right there. The truth is right there. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. It's right there. The cross is right there. And we wander in that spiritual wilderness. And we fail to just step into the promised land. Be because of our own rebellion. Because of our own hard hearts. Because of our sin. Because of our personal desires. Jesus and the promised land. Heaven and eternity is right there. And we walk just like the children of Israel. In that wilderness. Lost. When the promised land and the truth. It's right there. The call today is for you and I to just do what God says. God has paved the way through Jesus. He has handed us the truth. He has said, the invitation is yours. Come to me. Come on in. You know, Jesus sent a strong message. And that is this. The gospel is for everyone. Amen? Amen. It's for everyone. He didn't say, well, uh, you know, the gospel is only for white folks. He didn't say that. Oh, the gospel is only for Hispanics. He didn't say that. The gospel is only for black folks. He didn't say that. He said the gospel is for all. And he stands there at the gate of the promised land and he says, come in. I'm not even charging thing. You know, I'm going to tell you something. If there was a, a, a movie I mean, a great movie. Everybody wants to see this movie. And the guy stood at the door. And it costs like $25 to go to the movies now. You go to the movies. And he says, I want you to come to this movie. I don't have $25. It's a great movie, but I don't have $25. It's a great movie. I really want you to see it, but I don't have $25. If that man stood there with a megaphone, he said, the movie is free. And all who want to see the movie come into the theater. I am paying it all. How many people do you think would go into the movie theater to see that movie? Everybody. They'd be lined up for blocks. Well, just the other day, uh, right there in New York, they promised some little uh, game trinkets or game boys or whatever. And millions of young people lined up that, that ended up having a ride because there was nothing given away. But they all showed up to get that free gift, right? My friends, let me tell you something. If people will show up to get some game boys and some game paraphernalia by the droves because someone said it's free, think about what it would be like for a movie like that. A movie that everybody wanted to see. And they said it's free. You'd have the same line. You'd have the same group of people trying to get in free. We want to get in the theater. Listen, the gospel is that way. Jesus is the gatekeeper. And he stands there and he says, this life I'm giving you is free. All you have to do is walk through this door, come into my theater. This life I'm giving you is free. But even though Jesus stands there as the gatekeeper and he has the tickets ready to punch and he says it's free. My friends, you have got to grab people and pull them by the legs. You got the time and make them go into the theater. Amen. Am I right about it? And then even then, some of them want to get out. Some of them want to walk away. As a matter of fact, they'll even, I ain't going in there. I'm not going in there. That's the way it is. You know, we got to understand, what do we value? What do we value? What's more important? That guy that had those DeLoreans yesterday that I saw, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? My life is in those DeLoreans. I spent millions for those DeLoreans. They're worth millions, those DeLoreans. And then you die. You can't take it with you. 
We got it all wrong today, don't we? We got it all wrong when we lay up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. We've got it all wrong. We need to be laying up for ourselves, Jesus says, treasures in heaven that cannot be taken and that will not fade away. My friends, that's the problem in society today. Too many of us are behaving like the Israelites. Complain and murmur and hanging on to what we got. My friends, you can't take it with you. Jesus is the doorman and he's at the door of the theater. And he says, I want all to come unto me. All to come unto me and I will give them rest. Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30. He stands at the door and says, this is free. Won't you come? But yet, people walk by the theater. They reject and they spurn the invitation. And the result of that is they end up wandering for 40 years in a wilderness and they die lost. My friends, that doesn't have, have to happen to you or me. If we know the blessings and we know the truth and we've got faith and we stay faithful and we do what God says, you will have the victory. Amen? Amen. You will have the victory. Amen. Too much has been lost. Millions of Israelites lost their lives in the desert, not able to enter the promised land. Billions will lose their souls because they refused to accept this free ticket from the doorman named Jesus. They won't come into the theater. They won't enter that promised land. They won't come into the shelter. And they won't come into the shelter. You're right. Because that's the ark of safety. They won't come in. And my friends, when the Lord shuts the door of that spiritual ark, it'll be too late. I don't want that door to shut on you, and I certainly don't want it to shut on me. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to do what God says. I am not going to stand there and shake my fist at heaven and complain and murmur. I'm going to say, God, you got me. You got me. You're watching after me. You're, 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 I'm covered by the blood of Jesus and I will walk in faithfulness. I will walk in truth and I will walk and honor you forevermore. I won't wander in the wilderness 40 years lost. Now is the time and the day is the day. And I hope, trust and pray this lesson has been an encouragement to you and to me to see the error in doing the wrong thing and to see the value of doing the right thing. That's right, exactly. I hope, trust, and pray that this will motivate us to do what God says. Do what God says. Don't be like the children of Israel and wander out there. You know, y'all, I'm going to say this because y'all know it to be true. There's a lot of people on this campus wandering in the wilderness. Am I right about it? They're wandering in the wilderness. They're out there unable to enter the promised land because of their lack of faith. And it's sad. It's sad. We're going to go to God in prayer and uh